Uh, today our speaker is Dr. Peter Damiano from uh, the Physic, uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, uh, PPPL. Uh, Peter is a staff research physicist there. He received his PhD in 2002 uh, from the Department of Physics at University of Alberta, Canada. And then before joining PPPL in 2010, he has held a uh, uh, research positions at the uh, Mathematical Institute at the University of uh, St. Andrews in Scotland and then uh, Dartmouth College. Uh, Peter's interest, uh, research interest is mainly on the uh, studying the electron acceleration and energy transfer associated with magnetospheric L-fan waves uh, using kinetic simulations with uh, particular emphasis on global scale uh, field line resonances and uh, which we'll talk more uh, today. And also at Dartmouth, he, has, uh, involved, uh, he was involved in the research with Bell Larko and also Mike Wolberger uh, using LFM, a global MHD model, uh, to study the effects of ionosphere oxygen outflow on the coupled uh, magnetosphere ionosphere system, and also the solar control, solar wind control of the outflow and plasma sheet uh, transport. Okay. Uh, welcome. And also, uh, I'll put the mic here if you have questions. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Um, uh, today, I'll, as, as Han Lee said, I'll be talking to you about uh, kinetic simulations of electron acceleration in Alphanic Aurora. Now, this is uh, um, what I'll be showing today is work that mostly has been done at Princeton, but I want to credit uh, people that I've worked through over the years on this problem, uh, going back over a decade, uh, including John Sampson, who got me started in this direction in the first place, Rick Sidora, Andy Wright at St. Andrews, and now Jay Johnson at PPPL. So uh, the talk is broken up into, into several sections. Uh, and I'll, I'll start by just giving a very crude overview of magnetosphere-ionosphere coupling, just to put the, the problem in context. Then I'm going to discuss um, two limits of alphanic waves in the magnetosphere. Uh, global scale waves, which are very low frequency millihertz waves, which uh, sometimes are called field line resonances. And actually, the talk majority will be on this, because this is where most of the work that we've done is, has, most of this work is, uh, um, most of, the, most of the work that we've done has been on these low-frequency waves. Uh, then I'll, I'll go into uh, the, the idea of broadband aurora, which is more associated with dispersive scale waves. And I'll define all these as, as, um, as I'm going through the talk. And then, uh, beyond, and then if there's time, I'm going to just take sort of the context of electron acceleration by these waves in the, in the magnetosphere to, uh, to, uh, to the, both the uh, giant planets and the solar context, just for a very brief overview. So um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with the classic picture of the magnetosphere here. The solar wind is impinging on the day side, uh, compressing the, the magnetic field on the day side and giving you the, the long tail on the night side. Uh, the, mag the magnetic changes in the magnetic magnetosphere configuration drive field aligned currents. Uh, and these field aligned currents move, uh, travel, on, travel on the field lines to deposit electrons into the, uh, into the ionosphere. Uh, these, uh, the, the electron flux that's being carried into the ionosphere by the field line currents can then interact with the atmospheric gases to produce what we see as the visible aurora. Now, this is not a one-way process. Um, there's the, the, the pointing an electron flux that, that, you, that impinges into the ionosphere along the field lines also drives a significant outflow of heavy ions, which Allow, which, which additionally impact the magnetosphere configuration. So um, the, the auroral morphology associated with these field line currents uh, can be broken up into several categories. And for the global scale field line currents that are associated, like for the region one and region two currents, um, these are generally classified as monoenergetic aurora. There's a quasi-static um, potential drop uh, that the electrons are accelerated through. And, and, um, but it also applies to um, low-frequency alphane waves. And um, 
uh, and I'll, I'll I'll make I'll discuss more. Uh, so this is these low frequency alpha waves are are the field line resonances. And the broadband aurora are as generally associated with, uh, as I said before, kinetic scale, dispersive scale, alphane waves, in which the perpendicular scale length is on the order of the electron gyro radius, which is C over omega PE, the ion acoustic gyro radius, or the ion gyro radius. And uh, these, are, these are particularly important because they can also drive sus substantial outflow. Then there's also the diffuse aurora, which uh, are generated, usually associated with emic and Whistler waves in the, in the radiation belts. And uh, I will not really go delve into, into, the, uh, into the diffuse aurora, but I want to focus here on, on the alphanic and uh, the, the alphanic uh, uh, branches of, of, uh, of the monoenergetic aurora and the broadband aurora. Now, traditionally, alphanic aurora is, is, is implied to mean broadband aurora, but I prefer to broaden the definition to include these global scale low, low, low frequency waves be, and just because they are alphane waves. And I want to emphasize, I, what I want to illustrate, one of the things I want to illustrate today is that the acceleration characteristics of, of, uh, of electrons in the global scale waves and the dispersive scale waves are quite distinct. And the forces that are driving them are, are uh, the forces that are generated in the E-parallel are, are, are different. So the fundamental questions we want to answer is, uh, you know, how and where are electrons accelerated to carry the fill line currents by these waves? And also, what is, the, what is the feedback on the global system uh, of this electron energization? And I'll, that, that point will become a bit more clear as I get into, as I get into, the, into this presentation. So the, the mono this is a slide I borrowed from Chris Chaston, and it illustrates the basic properties of what are associated with monoenergetic and broadband aurora. So um, broadband aurora are, are actually very uh, tra very um, uh, uh, a transient, quick, uh, uh, evolving uh, um, auroral forms, whereas the uh, monoenergetic aurora are usually long, um, very long uh, uh, um, arc, stable arc structures. And the, character and the, the, the names come from the associated uh, characteristics of the electron energization. In the, uh, in the broadband case, you can see that the, there is a broad swath of, of, uh, of electrons with energies at all different, uh, with, uh, with the, there's a broad, electrons have all, a whole spectrum of energies in the broadband case. Whereas in the monoenergetic case, you can actually see there's, there's a very peak, there, there's a very sort of a monoenergetic peak in, in, the, in, the, electron, in the accelerated electron spectrum. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, how are electrons accelerated in these waves? Traditionally, alphane waves do not support field aligned currents. But there's two limits in which, in which alphane waves actually can support field aligned, can, 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 sorry, alphane waves don't support a paraelectric field. But there are, there, are two, there are traditionally two limits where a paraelectric field can be supported by these waves. And the first of these was identified by Gertz and Boswell in 1979 and the inertial alphane wave limit. And, and then the other one is Hasegawa in 76 with the its kinetic alphane wave limit. Now, now, in order to have a, um, uh, in order to have an e-parallel, you need an imp impedance to the electron motion along the field line. Essentially, the alphane waves are, uh, to first order, can be described as ion polarization current perpendicular to the field line, being closed by electron current parallel to the field line. Now, on, in certain limits, in, in, in the inertial alphane wave case, when lambda per becomes on the order of the electron inertial length, the electron mass becomes an impedance to the electron motion along the field line. So you need, you need, uh, you need a paraelectric field to develop to accelerate the electrons and maintain quasi-neutrality. In the kinetic alphane wave limit, uh, this impedance is due to electron pressure effects. Now, these, were, these waves are called dispersive because you introduce... Uh, um, you, it, uh, you introduce now into the dispersion relation the uh, the azimuth the the radial uh, the perpendicular wave number, and so they can actually disperse energy across field lines. Whereas traditional alphane wave limit, your energy is only confined to move along the field line. And uh, these these waves can also be described uh, these, uh, can also be described using the generalized Ohm's law, where E parallel this this first term here is is the electron inertial term. And the second term here gives you the kinetic alphane wave. 
So uh, now, with that, with that background, I want to sort of now discuss the monoenergetic aurora and low-frequency alphane waves. Um, now, when I say low-frequency alphane waves, I'll be referring to what are known as field line resonances. And field line resonances can be the result of mode conversion from fast compressional modes impinging, uh, say there's um, pressure fluctuations of the magnetopause boundary. You can generate compressional modes that, that propagate inward. They see an increasing alphane wave gradient, and part of this energy can be mode converted into, into uh, uh, a standing mode along, along a closed dipolar magnetic field line, which has the same wave number as the incident mode. Uh, and th th these are, these, uh, uh, these, these waves have very low frequency. They're on the order of millihertz. And so you, this, this, is a, this is an arc associated one, with one field line resonance. And you would see this arc uh, brighten, and, uh, uh, you know, brighten and dim with the frequency uh, of that, 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 that you see with, this, with the same millihertz frequency that's coming from, these, uh, uh, from, uh, from this analysis here of, of the magnetic field signature at the ground. Now, these, these waves have also been uh, seen in, uh, um, in simulations, for example, in the LFM simulation, Seth Claude Pierre illustrated the uh, formation of, of uh, standing waves within the, within the LFM simulation uh, due to pressure uh, perturbations in the solar wind. So um, the question is, you know, what, are, uh, what generates the paraelectric field in these field line resonance to actually accelerate the electrons along the field line? Uh, now, um, some of the first efforts in explaining this appeal to the dispersive alphane waves because the, this is um, uh, uh, because of the, of the comments I made previously. The, the issue with, with, the, with the dispersive alphane waves in these cases is that you actually have to allow your global scale energy to phase mix down into, into dispersive scale lengths. So not that these will not contribute, but it would take time for, for, the, for the system to actually get to a point where you have narrow enough scale lengths that electron inertial or kinetic alphane wave physics can actually come in. Another possibility is anomalous resistivity, which was uh, proposed by Lysak and Doom and also uh, Lotko et al. in 1998, um, which, is, uh, uh, which again uh, generates any parallel associated with, uh, with, with turbulence. In, in the auroral acceleration region, the Allen's resistivity due to turbulence in the auroral acceleration region. And it was also um, proposed and also discussed in terms of uh, another possibility that was discussed was mirror force effects, going back to Rankin in, in 1999. And this has, this, has a, um, uh, this has a precedence in quasi-static arcs where people for years have used the night relation to describe the current voltage relation along an auroral field line. So um, the fact that you're now dealing with a wave rather than a quasi-static situation doesn't mean that the mirror force does not have uh, um, relevance. It's just that originally I think people were approaching this from MHD theory, and so uh, where, where the, the mirror force was not uh, an issue, which is not, doesn't even consider the, the mirror force. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't seen as, it, uh, it wasn't, it w mm, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, the um, what I'm going to focus on today actually is is the is the last of these is is the last of these possibilities, and you can understand now, as I mentioned previously, that the the, the you, g you generate an e parallel when you have an impedance to the electron motion along the field line, and. Um, now the mirror force introduces an impedance because a large a large section of the of the electrons are actually trapped. Uh, the, the 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 loss cone is only you've got such a small loss cone you can't carry the field line current that you would need to uh, it, that you would need. So you have to develop a potential drop in order to accelerate electrons to to uh, to carry the field line current that's required by the wave. So um, when I started working on this problem. Uh, the question we, we all want to answer is actually, can we generate a sufficiently parallel due to meter force effects in a self-consistent consi simulation to accelerate electrons to KEV energies, which is what you would need to, to explain the auroral emissions, and also what are the, what are the signatures of this, of this electron acceleration? Uh, so in order to address this problem, 
uh, we developed a model uh, which I traditionally called the 2D hybrid MHD kinetic electron model. And the reason that for, this, uh, uh, for this name is that the, the ion polarization currents, which I explained previously as, co as, as being, is, is, covered by the, is covered by the cold plasma MHD equation. So what you have here is the cold plasma momentum equation, Ampere's law, and the perpendicular Ohm's law. Now, if we set E parallel equals to zero, this system of equations is completely self-consistent and explains the, uh, the massless electron response to ion polarization currents along the field line. So uh, in traditional MHD theory, you, you, uh, you neglect the electron mass, and you can, have e you can have parallel currents without parallel electric fields. Now, on top of that, we've, we've imposed a, a system of guiding center electrons, which means we're just treating not the electron gyro motion, but just the guiding center of the electrons as they move along the field line in the parallel direction. And this incorporates the, the magnetic mirror force, and, and the, the two systems are coupled via the parallel electric field. The, uh, for the coupling, we use the generalized Ohm's law, which includes the moments of the electron distribution function. And the, uh, the particle and field interpolation is done using standard uh, particle in, uh, in cell techniques. Um, so this, this half is, is uh, so the, the fluid side is solved on a set grid, on a set grid points in this dipolar topology. And the, the electrons are free to move everywhere in the, uh, in the simulation domain. And the uh, standard particle in cell tech means, means that you're using area weights to interpolate the fields to the particle positions to push them, and, the, uh, and, you're, and, and also to build the moments of the distribution functions at the, at the grid points. So in order to uh, uh, drive these uh, simulations, uh, I've used, uh, I, I use a velocity perturbation in uh, both perpendicular and parallel to the field line. Um, so what I'm illustrating here, this is the perpendicular profile at the equatorial plane, and this is the parallel profile along the L equals 10 field line. Now, for you that are familiar with the, with the uh, L parameter, it's, um, it just means that in the equatorial plane, L equals 10 means you're 10 RE from the, from the Earth. So uh, this, this, uh, this profile here corresponds to the analytical solution for uh, 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 fundamental mode field line resonance system. Uh, field line, uh, fundamental mode, standing mode along the field line. The reason we use a half Gaussian here is because uh, we want to set up a region of upward field of only upward field line current corresponding to the downward propagation of magnetospheric electrons because we're interested in the electron populations that are leading to the uh, to the formation of the aurora. So, so this this perturbation does not yield any upward field line currents. Uh, I mean, downward field line currents correspond to the upward propagation of ionospheric electrons. Um, which is something we want to consider a little bit later down the line. So this, what this, this movie is showing you the evolution of, a, uh, of an, both an MHD simulation. And when I say MHD here, I'm, I'm actually meaning the system of cold plasma, cold plasma MHD equations that I illustrated previously without any parallel electric field. And on the, uh, on the right-hand side, I'm showing the evolution of the hybrid model. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the, is the upper equatorial plane, the, the, upper, the upper hemisphere, sorry, has been unwrapped. And, and we're plotting this in curvilinear coordinates. So, it's, uh, so this, is the, this is the equator, and this is along the field line. And what you're seeing here is the, is the, the velocity perturbation that we impose at t equals 0 is, gonna, is having its, uh, its energy being transferred into, into magnetic energy and electron energy along the field line. And so you're seeing here is the growth of the field line currents as the system evolves from t equals zero to a quarter of an alpha period. And, um, so, and, and you're seeing the growth in the current due to the, due to the convergence of the, of the, of along, the, along the magnetic field line. So as, as you're moving along the field line, you're, uh, the flux tube's getting narrow and you're, you're your current is increasing dramatically uh, as electrons move faster to, to carry that the current to carry the, the field line current. Um, and th this is the evolution in the hybrid case. And I want to sort of um, highlight two two uh, two characteristics in, in the hybrid model case. You notice that there's 
a broader background, uh, there is a broader perpendicular extent to the, uh, um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the upward current region relative to the MHD case. And there also you see there's sort of this cross, there's this coupling of global scale energy to smaller perpendicular scale lengths. Both features that are sort of not evident in the, uh, uh, in the MHD. So this is one characteristic of what I was referring to previously as the feedback of, of the electron physics and how they're altering the evolution of the global mode. Um, so now what I'm, uh, what I'm illustrating in this plot is the energy of the, of the, of the electrons carrying the uh, current at the, at, the, at the current maximum here as a function of time. So what you're seeing is as the current grows, the energy of the electrons is, is growing as they're moving, as they, as they're moving faster to carry, um, uh, to carry the current. And what I'm illustrating two cases of a background ambient electron temperature of 200 eV and, and a background ambient electron temperature of a keV. With uh, the, uh, the larger, ba larger uh, ambient electron temperature, you actually have increased mirror force trapping. So, you're, so the, the, uh, the, the distribution function, the distribution of electron is more effectively trapped with a higher, with a higher, uh, with a higher temperature. So um, the remaining current carriers must be accelerated to higher velocity to actually carry the current. So that's what you're seeing in the KEV case, that the, um, uh, the fewer electrons are being accelerated to much higher velocity in order to carry the current. And you see that um, in this case, we're carrying current, we're energizing electrons to about um, uh, 2 keV, whereas in the 200 eV case, the electrons are only being accelerated to a few hundred eV. Uh, and you see this sort of uh, substructuring in the electron energization. And this is related to the average bounce dynamics of the electrons along the field line. Um, and as you, as you increase the temperature, the bounce frequency of the electrons is actually faster. So you see this, you see uh, a more frequent energy, you see these more, more frequent peaks in the energization. Um, now associated with this, um, associated with this acceleration is a dissipation of wave energy. And uh, well, first, what I want to point out is, as I, as I highlighted previously, this, um, what you notice here is you're seeing, you're seeing that an energization of, a, of almost a monoenergetic beam uh, um, at, uh, with this peak here at about, at about 2 keV. And that's consistent with this, this plot here illustrates the distribution function uh, at, at this time, uh, well, at, at a couple of times during the evolution. And what you see is you see, for, you see the formation of these ring distributions. And uh, so the uh, the constant radius of ring implies uh, implies a, a constant implies a, a sort of a monoenergetic distrib distribution, and uh, um, and you're seeing that the radius of the ring is increasing as as the uh, as the energy as the as the energy of this beam is increasing, and uh, associated with that um, associated with that energization, this is what what I'm plotting here is the is the is the wave energy, and so this is essentially the summation of the energy in the in the uh, uh, in the azimuthal velocity and magnetic field as a function of time, and you see in the in the MHD case this is relatively constant because in the MHD case this is constant because in the MHD case there's no transfer of energy to electrons you're just shuffling energy between the magnetic field and and the plasma velocity, uh, whereas now. In, in the hybrid model case, you're actually taking some of that energy and actually depositing in the acceleration of the electrons. So since, that, since some of those electrons are being precipitated out, this is a net drain of, of energy on the wave. So, um, and what this is illustrating is at t equals zero in, now traditionally field line resonances are, are a driven problem. You have, you have, a, um, you have a fast mode that's, that's, that would be, uh, uh, mode converting energy into the, into, the, uh, into the alphane mode over a period of time. We haven't done that in the simulation. We've just started with one perturbation. It's like plucking a string and letting it go. So we have a finite amount of energy at t equals zero. And so you can measure how much of this energy is, is gone during that dissipation 
over over this over this time. So, in uh, in a quarter of an alphane period, we've dissipated almost 20% of the energy in 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 the, in the acceleration of the electrons. So this implies that you would uh, that you would completely damp a, this global mode in in less than a, a couple of alphane periods. Um, and this traditional, the traditional dissipation mechanisms for, for these global scale waves would be uh, ohmic heating in the ionospheric Peterson currents. Now, uh, traditionally, di uh, dissipation in, in, uh, associated with these currents is on the order of two to 10 wave cycles. So you can see that the, uh, um, the, uh, the electron energization is actually similar magnitude of dissipation that you would you would associate with the ohmic heating in the in the in the in the in, in the ionospheric dissipation. Uh, there's a there's a very uh, right Andy Wright in 2003 did a very nice treatment of this in a two fluid capacity discussing the uh, the um, the relative influences of ionospheric dissipation and electron energization in. Uh, the ionospheric Peterson, the ohmic heating ionospheric Peterson currents, and the and the electron electron gener, electron energization <laughs> dissipation associated with electron energization, uh, um, and and you can see under certain conditions that this that this can actually exceed what would what would be so what we what you would associate with uh, the the dissipation associated with electron energization could could uh, could exceed by several factors the dissipation associated with ohmic dissipation in. Uh, in uh, the ionospheric Peterson currents. Now, I, I want to come back. Excuse me. I want to come back to the idea of um, uh, I mentioned before about the night relation and its use in uh, in. Uh, in describing the current voltage, voltage, current voltage relation along, along quasi-static auroral arc loops. Uh, and um, the night relation assumes electro, uh, adiabatic electrons, electrostatic um, potential, and a Maxwellian distribution function. Now, it's linear for a wide range of auroral parameters, and so the more complicated relation reduces uh, to this basic simple, simple, uh, this linear relation in terms of the potential drop along the field line. Now, uh, since, we, since these waves are so low frequency, millihertz, uh, it, we, we thought it was interesting to see if the night relation actually has any validity in describing the current voltage relation within the simulation. So what, what we would have done here is actually plot the, the solid line here is the, uh, is, the, uh, cur is the night relation, and the, um, the dotted lines are essentially the current voltage relation that's coming out of, of uh, calculated from the simulation, and you can see actually for for a for a, for, a, for smaller currents uh, that the um, there is there is a relatively good correspondence between both the night relation and and the current voltage relation coming from the model. And I don't think that's too surprising, just because uh, the electron transit time along the field line is so fast. That it's it's uh, it's almost um, uh, it, it's almost the same situation in 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 the sense that it's 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 almost it's it's quasi static uh, because the waves are so low frequency. Where they start to diverge is actually uh, where you start to get the evolution of the um, of the distribution function significantly from Maxwellian, and also in the in the in the simulation. When we're running for a long period of time, you actually start to run out of, of electrons available to carry the field aligned current. Uh, so you're, you're, what you end up doing uh, is, uh, because you're, um, once you've precipitated out all, all the easiest electrons to, to accelerate, you, end up just, you just end up keeping increasing the potential in the simulation to basically maintain uh, the, the, the current that, um, to maintain a saturated current. Uh, now, it's um, from this point of view. I just wanted to revisit the um, uh, the, the broadening that, that that was that I mentioned previously. Uh, um, from point both the point of view of the night relation and and the simulation. So uh, 
this, 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 these two plots illustrate the perpendicular profile, the field of line current, the ionospheric boundary for both, um, uh, for, from the hybrid model for the blue lines. And you can see that as, as, the, um, as, the, uh, as, the, as the background temperature of electrons is increasing, the, uh, the perpendicular profile actually widens. And this can be understood from the point of view that there's a perpendicular pointing flux associated with the parallel electric field uh, um, in the, in the, that's developing along the field line. So the larger this parallel electric field is, the, the, the more perpendicular pointing flux you have, so you can actually distribute more, you can distribute more energy, uh, so more, you get more energy moving to adjacent field lines, which then broadens the upward current region. And uh, using, the, using the night relation, you can actually also uh, calculate uh, an effective conductivity that you can then put into a resistive MHD calculation. And, and that's what we did. So essentially, it's the ba same basic set, set of equations as, as the hybrid model uh, for the MHD side. But now, instead of using the kinetic electrons, we're just using this simple uh, um, uh, parallel Ohm's law based on with a conductivity defined by the Knight relation. And you can see that at, for, for the early times I highlighted in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, um, simulation, for the low currents, I mean, I, I, I mentioned, I, I, I discussed here, you get a very good correspondence between the, um, between the hybrid model and, and the resistive model. So this is actually, one, it, it, um, it illustrates that this, this broadening that we're noticing in the hybrid model case is not, is, not a, a fa is, not a, is not something to do with more complicated wave particle interactions in the hybrid model. It is, it is simply due to the parallel field that's being generated uh, by, by the mirror force, uh, by the, the, in order to overcome the mirror force for the electron motion along the field line. And, um, and so that physics is, is, is encompassed in the night relation. And so we're seeing a similar broadening here. So it confirms that, that, um, that it's only the E parallel that's actually leading to, to the broadening that we're, that we're noticing in these upward current regions. It also is suggestive that possibly maybe a more complicated description could actually be used in a resistive MHD calculation that would mimic the effects of these kinetic simulations uh, without, you know, a, um, without the cost, without the overhead of, of, all, the, of all the electrons. But that, that's, uh, that's something that, that needs to be investigated further. Uh, as a final uh, point on this, uh, so I described before how the disperse, how the um, how the, the, the I described before the dispersive effects of the of the of the inertial and kinetic alphane waves, where e, where the um, uh, where because uh, now these wavelengths are a function of k perp, they can propagate energy across field lines. And what this what this bottom panel illustrates here is is a calcul is an MHD calculation where we're incorporating. Uh, electron inertial effects in this dotted line. And, and the, 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 the black line beneath it is basically um, uh, the same calculation without any E parallel. And the, the, uh, the, um, the red and blue lines are the resistive MHD calculations for, for two different uh, uh, conductivities defined by the night relation for these electron temperatures. So you see that the, the, the um, the dispersive characteristics of the mirror force, which are actually happening on a much, lar much, uh, much larger perpendicular scale than the inertial or the, or the kinetic alphane wave physics, is actually dominating the dispersive characteristics within these waves. And it's dominating the, um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, it's dominating both the generation of the E parallel and the dispersive characteristics of the waves. So I actually almost like to, to uh, to include this limit of a mirror force dominated global mode as, as what's, what was what's, what's denoted by Nakamura in 2000 in the same context as a mirror kinetic alphane wave. Because it has, it has the properties of, of the kinetic alphane wave, but the, um, um, in the sense of the dispersion and the E parallel, but it's, the physics driving it is substantially different. In the traditional kinetic alphane wave, it's, it's electron pressure effects. Here, it's the mirror force. 
So this is uh, one point I wanted to get at in terms of these global systems is that the, the, the driving physics is much different than what I'll discuss next in terms of the dispersive scale alpha N waves and the broadband aurora. So, um, and you can understand the, the monoenergetic nature of this energization in the sense that the, the E parallel that you generate along the field line is a consequence of the, uh, of the potential, I mean, the potential drop you generate along the field line is a consequence of the, of the electron distribution uh, along that entire field line. And so the, 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 um, the, the particles are falling through a consistent potential drop. They're all being accelerated with a consistent energy. So you sort of get, that's what gives it this monoenergetic characteristic. Whereas in the broadband case, the, the, uh, the acceleration is very local. And, and the E parallel depends very much on the local characteristics. And so because you have such a, uh, well, I'll come back to this in a, in a, in a, in a moment. So just as a, as a summary uh, the, uh, of, of the field line resonance. So we, we have illustrated that mirror force effects in field line resonance self-consistently can generate sufficient potential drop to accelerate electrons to KV energies. Uh, the mirror force effects lead to a dispersion of wave energy perpendicular to B naught. And this is, this is a consequence that we didn't expect when we, when we outset, when we, when we set out to do these uh, numerical experiments. Um, and also the fact that, that the electron acceleration is a significant sink of wave energy. So the, these are consequences of what I was talking about, the feedback of the electron energization. How does this impact the global system? And the, these, are, these are two key points that, that came out of, of, uh, of this effort. Uh, one thing I didn't elaborate on too much and we're still investigating is there was this, this cross-scale coupling that, that, that we're noticing in the, in the hybrid model simulations. And it, it's, we think it may be linked to electron bounce dynamics, but that's a feature we're still investigating. And, um, but even with this cross-scale coupling in these global systems, the, phys the physics driving the electron energization is global, whereas uh, when, I, when I'm going to be talking about the broadband aurora, what's going to be driving it is actually how does the energy get to the kinetic scales in that case, whereas here it's, it's the uh, to first order, it's, it's, the, it's the global scale that's doing the driving. And so uh, in terms of future directions, we want to incorporate ion gyro radius effects because this alters the parallel electric field profile along the field line and consequently will affect the characteristics of electron energization. That's never been considered in a, in a kinetic simulation. And also, uh, in order to properly treat this, what we've done here is simulate a global mode for at max a half an alpha in period. Because by the time you get to the half, you want the current to turn over. You're going to start getting ionospheric electrons coming upward from the ionosphere to carry the downward current. And we don't have that in the, in the model presently. So we want to incorporate an ionospheric population that will move up from the, from the, from the ionospheric boundaries so we can actually sort of do uh, a multi-period simulation to treat, these, um, uh, uh, to treat these systems more, more consistently. And I mean, the, the, uh, the, the upflow of ionospheric electrons into the, into, the, into the flux tube is also a source of replenishing uh, of, of electrons that were, that were precipitated in the previous cycle to carry the current in, in the subsequent periods. And, and how, how these two systems work together is, is completely uh, um, unstudied. So, uh, and now I'll, I want to treat the subject of the broadband aurora and dispersive scale alphane waves. Now this is something I've only actually been working on probably for about a year. So it's, it's much less developed than uh, than the field line resonance case, but I want to sort of give you a flavor of where we're going with it and, and what, what are the important um, uh, things that, that, that need to be considered. So one, one of the features of the broadband aurora is they increase rapidly with substorm onset, uh, you know, um, with, with the dipolarization of the stretch magnetotail. Uh, now, energy that, that, that's being released at the onset can take different paths to the ionosphere. So, um, uh, uh, that, so one question is, is uh, understanding both the path and, 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 the, and the time it takes uh, the wave signatures to reach the source region to the ionosphere helps you identify what, 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 mechani what, and what mechanism 
is, is uh, um, what is the driving mechanism for the, for the substorm onset. Um, another, quite, another important uh, um, uh, question is, you know, the, the dispersive scale structuring that's associated with these waves, it is, is it imposed at the reconnection site? Does it evolve with the wave in transit? Uh, these are all sort of open questions that, that, are, um, that, that sort of need to be addressed. And um, uh, the, the, the association of the, of the broadband aurora with, um, with uh, 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 alphanic, dispersive, al dispersive alphanic pointing flux is, is, is brought to light in, the, in these observations. So here you see a broadband electron energy flux from wing et al. 2013. And here you see the downward point, the alphanic downward alphanic pointing flux uh, from the study of Kyling et al. 2003, and you see a very good correspondence between the precipitating electron uh, signatures and the, and, the, and the alphanic pointing flux. Uh, and this was uh, looking at the uh, alphanic pointing flux associated with, uh, with, um, uh, with al in global simulations uh, with reconnection, the tail was also illustrated with LFM studies, um, which it, and shows a very similar signature as in the, as in the Kyling study. So now, as, I'm con as I mentioned previously, the, the, um, when, you have an, when you have a wave moving along the field line, a, a, a dispersive scale wave moving along the field line, uh, it, it, it experiences a very different plasma environment as it, as it goes from the equator to the ionosphere. Up here we have uh, the characteristics where the thermal velocity of distribution exceeds VA, which puts you in the kinetic alphane wave limit. And then as you get toward the ionospheric boundary, you're into the inertial alphane wave limit. Now, the, the, how, the, how the electrons interact with the wave can, can vary depending on where you are. The, uh, uh, in the inertial alphane wave regime, you can have what's called Fermi acceleration. It's essentially uh, uh, what happens when um, a, the, the, a tail, the tail of the distribution does not have sufficient energy to get over the potential well of the, of the wave incoming, and it gets essentially snow plowed ahead of the wave. And um, that, that, that you can accelerate to electrons to twice the velocity, twice the phase velocity of the wave. And this was originally illustrated by Kletzing et al. in, uh, in 1994. And then in the, in the, uh, in the kinetic alphane wave regime, you can have uh, trapping of, of electrons. And this is associated. And the interaction between the electrons and the wave here is, is, is actually associated with Landau, tra with Landau damping effects, where uh, the, the, uh, um, the phase velocity of the, of the wave has to overlap the, um, the uh, the distribution of the of the, uh, the, the, uh, the electron distribution. Uh, so there's been, as I and this was, and there's been a significant body of work that um, that's that's looked at ele electron acceleration dispersive scale alphane waves. Uh, and so, in what we're doing, we're not we're not new to to trying to to um, uh, to contribute to this. But the studies that have been done so far are mostly. Uh, either test particle, 1D self-consistent, or, or more localized if, if you're multidimensional. So you might consider a box here. Or, and so um, what, what needs to be done is to address the acceleration in a more global context in order to understand how the wave energy might be getting, is getting from the, uh, from the plasma sheet to the ionosphere. And also, there are open questions that have not be really been considered uh, uh, completely is the effect of ion gyrodes effects. This changes the phase speed of the wave, which changes how the wave is going to couple to the electrons. And also, how, how is the energy actually uh, reaching these dispersive scales? And for that sort of consideration, you need at least uh, a, 2D, uh, a 2D simulation uh, to, to do that. So um, this, this plot here sure illustrates uh, a very initial attempts at, at, at simulating uh, uh, an alphane wave propagating from the equatorial region to the ionosphere. And so actually what I've done here is this is the, is, uh, is just perturbed, uh, put a, 
instead of instead of uh, starting with a, a field, uh, with a perturbation that goes along the entire field lines, I did in the field line resonance case. We're starting with a very localized Gaussian packet, and this packet breaks up and launches waves that propagate both directions toward the toward the respective ionospheres. This shows you the perpendicular profile uh, in the equatorial plane, and it, it's it's very narrow on the order of 0.1 Earth radii. When you map that down to the to our ionospheric boundary at present, which is at an altitude of one RE above the surface of the Earth, this becomes a perpendicular resolution of on the order of five kilometers, which is on the order of the of the electron inertial length in the simulation. Uh, and this um, this is illustrating the the um, uh, the both the current the current profile along the field line. So this is starting from the equator. To the to the ionospheric boundary, and what we're doing here is is I'm considering this field line here, which is where the maximum upward current region will occur. And this shows you the uh, the parallel current along the field line. So as the as the flux tube is narrowing, you're seeing the current density increase, and this shows you the the accelerated electron distribution at the at the ionosphere, and. So you see where we started with a background temperature of actually very cold for magnetospheric plasma of 50 eV. And, but, but with the end result being a very broad distribution of energy as, as, you would, as, would, um, um, as would be expected for in, in sort of with the, for these broad, um, for, the, for the case of the broadband aurora. Um, so qualitatively, um, we're producing results that are consistent with other studies and and uh, and and, we'll, and consistent with with observations. Now, what we want to address is how, what ha what happens with the inclusion of the ion gyrodes effects to 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 this picture. And the the importance of ion gyrodes effects um, come in can be understood just by looking at the at the at the dispersion relation. Uh, for the kinetic alphane wave, you have the contribution here from the uh, um, from the ion acoustic gyro radius, and then and then the ion gyro radius is the last term. Now, in the in the plasma sheet, uh, Ti over Te is is is, is about seven uh, from Baum Johan et al. at 1987, and so you see that uh, that this uh, this contribution would dominate over over this. And so, by by incorporating the the, the ion gyrodes effects, uh, you're you're significantly increasing the phase velocity of the wave. And so, what does that do to the electron coupling? Well, that can be that can sort of be seen in this in this bottom plot here, which illustrates um, a standing wave in a uniform magnetic field, standing alphane wave. And so, we have uh, the magnetic field. Is in the z direction, so this jz is the is the parallel current, and you see that uh, when you when you have uh, um, when when ion gyrodes effects are shut off, so k per rho is essentially zero. You see, you get the very strong classic signature of Landau damping, and you can see that here as well with the plateauing of of the of the distribution function. So you're losing you're you're losing um, significant a significant amount of wave energy. To, to the uh, to the electrons. Uh, now, if we if we consider the if we actually now make k per rho on the order of one, you've so you've increased the phase velocity of the wave substantially that you're actually moving the the uh, the Landau resonance position into the tail of the distribution. Now, the strength of the coupling is dependent on the slope of the distribution function. So, as the as as you get to the tail, the the uh, the um, coupling becomes much weaker. And you see that you're almost coupling no energy. Uh, you're almost taking no energy from, from the wave. So that has, that has relevance because in, the, in this region out here, it's, this, it's the Landau, it's the Landau uh, damping coupling between the, uh, that couples the energy from the, from the, uh, from the wave to the, to the particles, the electrons. So by changing the characteristics of where that resonance is happening, you're changing uh, uh, you're changing um, how, how how much energy is actually getting into the electrons, and and also so one one possible one possible uh, result is that actually waves that are sourced here might actually propagate unimpeded more to the inertial regime uh, and couple their energy there rather than here, 
if, 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 if you include more realistic uh, iron gyrodes effects. So it has implications for where and how the, the electrons are coupling energy to the wave. The, the, the wave is coupling energy to the electrons. Um, another consequence of this is, you know, the, uh, the you're, you're, you're changing, by changing the propagation speed of the wave, you're actually changing how long it takes for it to move from the plasma sheet to the ionosphere, which has implications for connecting the substorm onset to the ionospheric signatures of the, of the, uh, the, the process that's starting, the, that's driving the substorm onset to the signature of the ionosphere. So in order to address this, we, we generalize the model by the inclusion of iron dry radius physics on the MHD side via the uh, kinetic fluid model of Chang and Johnson in 1999. Now, I won't go into great detail, but this involves uh, a, 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 a modified momentum equation in terms of, uh, in terms of a modified velocity and a, and a modified perpendicular Ohm's law. And the consequence uh, of, of this addition here, you can see in, um, in uh, this is a very, a very initial simulation where uh, what I'm doing here is propagating two pulses from the equatorial plane, starting with identical conditions, except for the fact that in the first case, which is actually what I was mentioning previously, TI is zero, and now we have TI is KEV and TE is 100 EV. So we have a quasi-realistic um, ion to electron temperature ratio for the plasma sheet. I think this is actually the first time this has been done in the context of a magnetic self-consistent magnetospheric simulation in propagating, uh, in considering uh, propagation of waves all the way from the flux tube to, to the, toward the ionosphere. Um, and what you're seeing here is, um, you're seeing A, that the phase velocity of the wave is moving substantially quicker. The wave is moving substantially quicker when you have the realistic ratio of Ti to Te. And for example, here, you're, it's almost two RE ahead of the, of the peak um, of the wave when, when, you, when you had uh, Ti equal to zero. Uh, and also, you're, you're seeing this, um, uh, you're seeing a, 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 sp a greater spreading of the, of the wave energy along the field line. And that's simply a consequence of the fact that uh, um, K perp is actually getting larger as you move along the field line. So the leading edge is actually traveling faster than the trailing edge of the wave. So you're, 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 moving, you're, you're, moving this, you're dispersing this energy along the field line. And uh, I mean, this, this simulation doesn't go all the way. I, uh, just for the moment, I actually truncated this. I actually have my upper boundary sort of here. So I can't make yet make the same uh, 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 just for initial, some initial studies. I can't make the same comment of what this is going to do to the, uh, to the accelerated population of the ionosphere. But that's work I'm, I'm progressing on right now. So um, the, the uh, so initial simulation of the dispersive alpha waves, you know, give a, give a broad spectrum of electron energies as would be expected. Uh, the electron, the inclusion of rho i effect significantly reduces the transit time to the wave of the of the of the wave to the ionosphere for realistic uh, ion to electron temperatures. Uh, we're presently investigating the the effects of this of this on the electron energization. Uh, again, as in the field line resonance system, in order to accurately model. What the, what the distribution of electrons is going to look like close to the ionospheric boundary, we actually need to have an ionospheric population in the simulation. And so that, that's, that's one thing that we're, we will, we'll, we'll be implementing. And the other big uncertain question, probably the more uncertain question, about these dispersive scale alpha waves is how does this energy actually get to the dispersive scale? And this is something that we, we want to try to address with the code. And uh, there have been a, several mechanisms put forward. One possibility is phase mixing, which um, I'll explain more completely in a minute. Uh, and th this is actually something we can address, you know, presently. The the other is, for example, turbulent cascade, uh, um, and this was uh, uh, this was, for example, uh, Chasenal simulated in 2011 with uh, with an MHD approach. And we are trying to move in that direction as well by making our MHD description nonlinear so we can actually try to consider how global scale energy, you know, uh, uh, how global scale energy would actually be reaching 
the, these dispersive scalings. You know, is it is it is it is it a turbulent cascade? Is the energy being imposed at the reconnection site, um, for example, by a ballooning mode or something like that? So, so there, there's there's a lot of um, work to be done in actually understanding how this energy is actually reaching dispersive scales. And uh, just I wasn't clear if if everyone understood what phase mixing was. So I just prepared sort of um, a slide to illustrate that in the um, uh, if, if you have a density gradient uh, perpendicular to the field line, you get, a, you get a gradient in the alphane speed. And that means that uh, since omega equals k parallel VA, that means the, the, frequency of the, uh, the frequency of the wave on every field line is slightly different. So over several periods, the, wave, the, the waves on adjacent field lines are going to detune. And so a situation that started as broad is going to end up ending, so this initial perturbation was just a Gaussian that was wide here. You end up getting a finer, finer scale structuring as a function of time. And so this is one way, one means by which global scale energy can actually cascade down to, um, to dispersive scale lengths. And I'm contrasting here MHD simulations. In the MHD case, all the energy is going to do is just get to narrower scales until you reach your grid, unless you have some dissipation mechanism in there. I'm contrasting this with the kinetic simulation where the energy is being actually lost to the electrons. And you can actually see as you get narrower, you actually lose more and more energy to, 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 to electron energization. And this is, uh, um, so this is relevant to the electron coupling and kinetic alphane waves. And this just shows you, uh, this, is, uh, this was uh, more of a, just a, 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 a study for standing modes, but this is, uh, this is, this is work by Lysak and Song using, an MA, again, an MHD simulation to look at uh, uh, phase mixing in the ionospheric alphane resonator uh, as, a mode, as a means of coupling energy to very small dispersive scalings. So um, now I'm just, I just prepared a few slides to, uh, to try to put the, the context of, of what we've developed in the magnetosphere context, and, and you know, what other applicability does it have outside of the of the of the magnetosphere, of the terrestrial magnetosphere? And so, um, one one uh, one, uh, um, uh, one one possibility is the uh, is, for example, in the giant planet magnetospheres, you get uh, the the IO, for example. The you, you see that this is a, a I think this is a, a shot from the HST, but you see this this trailing. This this uh, this uh, uh, outer outer uh, auroral signature here, and this is associated with the uh, the wake of Io as it moves through the plasma torus, and as it moves through this torus, it's generating alphane waves that are firing down the field line, and so these 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 uh, and and leading to and these are simulations, for example, done by Hess et al. in 2010, which again illustrate the. Um, um, uh, the broadband signatures that are associated with dispersive alphane wave activity. Um, in the solar, in the context of the corona, we can actually look at it from both uh, the, um, the, it, from both the, the, the top and uh, in the context of loops from both the top and the bottom context. In terms, of the, in terms of the top context, what I mean is the solar flare impulsive phase. So um, traditionally, uh, what you, when you have a flare, you get the formation of what are called X-ray bright points at the footprints. And what, what's happening is uh, electrons are accelerated down the field line and hitting the, the, uh, the, uh, the chromosphere, the photosphere, and, and generating these X-rays, which, 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 which appear as these bright points. Now, traditionally, it's assumed that the, that the, uh, that the reconnection itself is generating the parallelectric field that's accelerating the electrons. But this runs into what's called the number problem in that you're accelerating 10 to the 39 electrons on the order of a minute. And you have, you have sort of a, uh, there's the, you're actually almost evacuating the entire corona to, 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 um, uh, to generate enough electrons to get the, the, uh, the, the emissions in terms, of what's, uh, in terms of the thick target model for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for, at the foot points. So it's been proposed by Fletcher and Hudson and others in 2008 about uh, what, I mean, alphane waves, alphane waves are generated reconnection 
you know, MHC simulations illustrate this. You also generate fast modes, which can actually mode convert into alphane waves. So what about actually carrying some of this energy down, you know, as alphane waves down into the, the uh, uh, higher density regions toward the corona and the chromosphere, where you, where you have no dearth, where you have no lack of supply of electrons to actually, um, to actually be accelerated. Uh, another consequence is, is for coronal heating. Uh, as, the, as a lot of the observations that Scott has illustrated, you know, there, there's, a, there's a huge amount of alphanic energy in, in, the chromos, in, the, in the chromosphere. Waves are being launched out all, all the time. So, so you know, the, the, um, this, could, this could be fundamental to both the generation of the, of the, of the solar wind and the heating of, of coronal loops. Um, so, Either end, looking at it from either end, either the impulsive phase of flares or, or the the um, uh, the uh, the coronal heating problem, it's assumed that the 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 alphane waves would interact again with the electrons on 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 dispersive scales, and so in the context of the magnetosphere, dispersive scales the order of, of kilometers. When you look at the coronal parameters. The, the dispersive scale is on the order of 10 centimeters. So you really have to get your energy down to, um, to very narrow perpendicular scale lengths. And, and depending on your parameters, your, your loop could be either in the kinetic alphane wave or the inertial alphane re wave regime. And this shows you some theoretical work done by McClements and Fletcher in 2009, which illustrate you know, if you could get down to these scale lengths, what fraction of the electron distribution function would you accelerate? And indeed, and if you could get down, and this is, a, this is for inertial alphane waves, you can get down to very narrow perpendicular scale lengths, then, then, then these waves could probably very efficiently accelerate electrons. So again, we're back to the question of how does energy reach these waves? And again, you know, phase mixing was, was, uh, was proposed in the, you know, and the density gradients on the edges of coronal loops uh, by Ciclori et al. in 2005, and, and, you know, again, turbulent cascade. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, overlap between the relevance of what we're doing in the magnetospheric context to, to, um, to both solar and giant, planetosphere, giant planet magnetospheres. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there, there's, there's, um, there's a couple of numerical difficulties here, and I, I think that, yeah, you can get some. Uh, um, I think you can get some instabilities forming at, at, when, when you try to load these electrons. At, 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 and, and I haven't. That's not something I've, I've, uh, I've uh, um, looked into so too much yet. Uh, but I, I do foresee that there could be some some difficulties in implementing this. The other caveat is that the, the density increase, uh, the, as you approach the ionosphere boundary, you're jumping, you're jumping several sort of magnitude in, uh, in, um, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in electron density and ion density. Um, now, one way around that is to treat the cold population as a, as a fluid which was done by Dan Swift in 2007. Um, and that, that, uh, then that doesn't allow you the electrons to, to um, uh, that doesn't allow you, how, 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 do, how, do the cold, how do the cold electrons contribute to the distribution function? So um, we're thinking of, uh, th there's, there's other kinetic schemes you can use that, that would allow us to treat part of the distribution function as kinetic and, uh, but assume, uh, assume a fixed background so that we could have 
we could have sort of assume that most electrons are not going to contribute, but there'll be a small percentage that will be coupled. So that that would give us a more realistic, um, a, mo a, a more realistic. Uh, uh, what, what, what the distribution would, would look like, because you would have both the cold and the hot population intermingling. Sure. No, Kyling. Oh, did I go? I, go, I went right past it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Yeah. Well, I I can't comment on wing doesn't why wing doesn't see the cusp here. Uh, it could be that they're just focusing uh, on the tail data. I'm not sure. Um, our primarily focus would be on, on the processes in the magneto tail, because that's what you would see uh, uh, associated. Th this is associated with substorm onset, a lot of these broadband aurora mo a, a lot of the time. So I don't, I don't think, well. What, what's that a, what is that a plot of? So this is a plot of the broadband energy flux uh, from, from the DM, D, DMSP satellite, averaged over, averaged over uh, several, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, uh, no, actually, I think I think I think we would be an interest on day side processes. You just haven't thought in that direction. Would be would be the way to put it. Yeah. Sorry. Well, so I mean, phase mixing. Um, so phase mixing applies to any alphane wave. Now, the consequence of having dispersive scale limit w physics in there is that means that your actual phase mixing will stop at some point. So if you have a if you have a standard MHD picture with no dispersive wave physics in it, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to you're going to keep you're going to keep uh, phase mixing energy right down to the grid scale of your simulation. When you have a dispersive alphane wave physics, for example, when you incorporate, if I, so what I'm saying here is if you, uh, I'll go back to my equation slide here. Uh, so if you're simulating these with the, uh, with the coplasma MHD equations, but you allow for the inclusion of the generalized Ohm's law so that now you have inertial alphane wave, kinetic alphane wave physics, what will happen in your simulation is you will actually phase mix down to the electron inertial length, for example, in that limit, and then you'll start propagating energy away from, from the region because it's dispersive. So, so it, it, it will stop. It will stop uh, phase mixing. It will, you'll, you'll radiate energy away. And it won't narrow any longer. And that, that, that would happen as well in the, in the, in the, in the kinetic alphane wave limit. Now, the, the important thing is that it actually, that, but that's where the electron coupling is going to happen. So the important thing is that it reaches the dispersive limit. And, but that's the difference between the MHD and, and the dispersive MHD, and, and, the, and, uh, and having the dispersive wave physics in your MHD description. Thank you very much.